Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A very good day to you and welcome to another edition of Life Matters. And remember, if you are watching us anywhere in the world, if you know some friends and family loves the channel and loves watching Life Matters and all the other shows we have on Hilal TV, they can tune in via the World Wide Web and they can watch it on hilal.tv and stream live. Um, we've also got an app going, but we'll keep our viewers in suspense for that. Um, but uh, inshallah soon. Uh, you can catch us on our latest app. So today we're discussing a very special topic. Dear to all the hearts of Muslims, it's one of our five pillars. If one is able to go on Hajj, but in a different light, preparing young children when parents are embarking on this blessed journey of Hajj, knowing how to deal with them while parents are away and also helping parents prepare and deal with the separation. Joining me online is Nabila Gangat, an experienced educational psychologist with a passion for supporting families and young children. Now, Nabila has a special interest in working with families and young children who have emotional difficulties. Nabila also enjoys working with teenagers, adolescents and young adults and young adults specifically who have life difficulties. She also works with uh, these young adults in order to ensure that their full potential is achieved. Now, Nabila is passionate about serving the Muslim community, which has a massive need for mental health services. I have to also add that Nabila is also a new Haji, Alhamdulillah, performed a Hajj just last year. So welcome, Nabila. Assalamu alaikum to you. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Shukran so much for joining me online. I know we've connected like almost a year ago trying to just to have a show, but inshallah we hope to see Navila and her expertise um, online with us very, very soon. But specifically I contacted you because you know you're in the arena of psychology and dealing with young little ones and especially because you're a new haji yourself and uh, we appreciate you offering us our time. So Navila, let's start with the significance of hajj in a Muslim's life, how can parents, caregivers and guardians explain why it's a special invitation from Allah and what was it like for you last year thinking back? Shukran so much Khawa, for having me on your show and yes it has been a long long time. Um, I'm really really happy to be here. Um, in terms of the significance of Hajj in a Muslim's life, I do think that it is really, really important that when little ones learn about the five pillars of Islam, Hajj is mentioned as one of the five pillars of Islam, but there's never really um, a deep connection unless there is now a family member or a close loved one or even a set of parents now going for Hajj. Um, children do understand the the. The, the, the significance of Hajj, but they never really fully understand it. And I think as parents, when you do, for example, in the South African context, get accredited for Hajj in terms of the sahut list and the waiting list, which is quite long and there is a long waiting period, to explain that now it's our special turn and we've been waiting in queue for a few years. Um, and this is something that given the financial means and you have the ability to then perform one of your five pillars of Islam, that children need to be involved in these discussions to say, Allah sent me a special invite and now is my turn to be part of this delegation that goes towards um, obviously the plains of Makkah and Medina to obviously perform this very, very sacred rituals in these special significant places that you cannot perform anywhere else. And I think explaining that significance in terms of number one, your turn that has come, you have the financial means, which obviously, Alhamdulillah, Allah has provided for you to then undertake this really, really special journey. And then obviously that Hajj cannot be replicated anywhere else besides what we now follow in terms of our beloved um, uh, uh, Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, in terms of what he performed, all these special rituals. And then obviously, our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam making the Hajj um, journey himself. Um, I think explaining this and tying this into why it's important in, term, in terms of a Muslim going to fulfill these very special rituals and rites. Um, because our, our kids learn this and lots of kids learn it in maktab and madrasa, but making it very um, sig significant for you and your family, I think that is super important. A lot of children and a lot of families sometimes maybe before they perform their Hajj, they have also, for example, got to have the, the beautiful journey of Umrah. 
and that can also be involved in it. There's such specific rituals around the Kaaba, the, the Umrah, the Tawaf, which you can't perform anywhere else. And I think explaining that to young kids makes that more, uh, gives them a little bit more understanding that mommy and daddy have to now leave and go there in order to do these very, very special rites and rituals. So now let's understand the parents and how they can prepare themselves spiritually and emotionally before, of course, embarking on this, this great spiritual journey and still involve and show the children in the household so they can feel how special it is. There was the link in terms of where they lift up the kiswa of the Kaaba and they then put on this beautiful white ihram on the, on the beautiful Kaaba. I think we're so fortunate today in the, the time that we live where yeah. we can tune in, watch on YouTube and look at the special journey that, I mean, now the special significance even of the Kaaba donning the ihram, which is so beautiful mm -hmm. to see. Um, and I think if you, for example, switch on um, any, any live stream in terms of uh, the Kaaba and the kids can then almost feel connected yeah. to say, well, that's the beautiful Kaaba that mommy and daddy are now going to, to see and visit Allah's house with a special invite. I think that does give um, kids a real concrete connection. One of the very difficult things sometimes for parents to understand is kids like concrete or real objects that they can actually see. So, for example, if you have uh, toys, um, and I know there's, there's beautiful uh, things that people can actually make and crochet in terms of kabas and little, all the little figurines in terms of where you can actually play with kids to say, well, this is some of the rites and rituals around um, what uh, kids actually enjoy uh, and understand, then parents need to involve kids in a very concrete way. So a lot of role play, a lot of um, talking around why it's significant to, for example, go around the Kaaba seven times, what is the significance of the waf? Mm. Um, why should we uh, do the different rites and rituals of every step of Hajj? And there's beautiful classes that people go and prepare themselves to. And once you maybe come back from that class, if you have a conversation with your children through drawings, pictures, some of the toys that you take out, mm. I think it is important that children then understand um, these things in a more concrete way. And I think emotionally, uh, uh, some parents are individuals like Devin Vakhaj, there's at such a high, they even give off the whole persona that, you know what, I'm not coming back. This could be like the old people used to do, you know, that, okay, they went away for many yes. months. Um, but it, it is sort of the last act that's on, on your list from the five pillars that you feel now you, you Allah is finally giving you the opportunity to perform. And then you have this feeling that you actually give off to your children. And I remember one of the younger kids saying, I think there were five or something, so mommy, are you not coming back at all? You know, is this, you know, like, because that's what you prepare mm -hmm. yourself for your death almost when you go on Hajj because you don't know if you're coming mm -hmm. back. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about that connection, that spiritual connection where you're at such a high, you actually disconnect with the children um, in a way. So the, the most beautiful journey of Hajj, obviously, is yes, we do hope that Allah does take us and I mean, we, we get to, 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 to die in the sacred lands. But obviously for a child, this is quite a scary thought and experience that mommy is not coming back. We have to then prepare our children that yes, we, we inshallah are coming back, but this is also something that is not entirely in our control and power. And inshallah, Allah does bring us back to, to connect with you again. And I think that's a different kind of taqwa and understanding or spiritual awareness that maybe parents need to have and you understand each child. I find that children who are very sensitive, sometimes having these conversations can be quite triggering. Mm. So you need to steer clear of that and almost watch yourself spiritually as an adult or as a parent in that you're not going to really have that almost transmitted to them because that obviously can make them very anxious and worried that maybe mommy or dad is not coming back because now this is so, ex I mean, that is obviously a good position for the mom or dad. But mm. for the child, it's very scary having, I mean, we're using parents as an example, but any loved one that, for example, maybe doesn't come back and there is that sense of like separation and you're so far away and I'm not really sure what is happening. So I think these kind of things, you need to check and watch the temperament of a child okay. in terms of how much you then share. Mm -hmm. um, but spiritually, that is something that is your journey and your path, which you can share with your children, but mm -hmm. not obviously to such a deep level that based on their age, I mean, with teenagers, I think it is slightly different. I'm talking about young kids under the age of, I would say, yeah. eight, 
under the age of five. Mm. These kind of kids and conversations, they don't really sit well with them. They can be quite triggering in terms yeah. of anxiety and worry. So just be conscious of, of your child and every child's temperament. There's five of them, two of them, three of them. They're all different. Thank you. That was beautiful, Nabila. After the short break, we talk about temporary separation and staying connected and making them understand that it is just temporary. More just after the short break, don't forget to connect with us as well via WhatsApp. Tell us about your Hajj experience, your Hajj experience with your children being connected but still from a distance. But we'll talk more with uh, Nabila Kangat, our skilled educational psychologist colleges just after the sugar break back in a moment Welcome back. Assalamu alaikum. Very good day to you online. We have Nabila Gangat, a practicing educational psychologist based out here in Johannesburg, who specializes in play therapy, supporting and identifying special needs of children and providing emotional support for children and adolescents. She also addresses bullying, bullying rather, in a positive manner. So welcome back, Nabila. Just uh, taking us into the the arena of separation, a temporary separation and staying connected. How can parents explain this concept of temporary separation for the young ones as you just elaborated before the break? So a separation sometimes can be explained and should be practiced before, for example, parents have an indication of how long, for example, their Hajj journey will be mm -hmm. and also then make preparations in terms of whether kids are staying in their own home with other adults joining, for example, aunts, uncles, grandparents, or for example, are the kids now going to be able to, are they, do they have to move to a different home, for example, for their time? I think this needs to be practiced before. So I would say at least two or three weeks or even the week before uh, parents actually leave, try and prepare the separation. And that separation itself, once kids are either staying with other caregivers, guardians, grandparents, aunts, uncles, then parents need to have a conversation that it was a short time for two nights you slept over um, with aunt so-and-so or grandma or nani, nana, dadi, dada, whoever looked after you in that time. And that can obviously then um, have a little bit of understanding in that it is a time that I'm going to be away from you, but there is a time where inshallah I will come back and I will join you back home. Um, I think that's something that very, very, very young kids might struggle with. And this is something that you're going to then have to think of ways in terms of dealing with the separation. Hmm. Some of the nicest ways that I explain uh, to parents is if you, for example, leave a, a watch or bracelet behind for, for example, girls, boys, you can ask to, uh, sometimes they like the smell of parents, so, uh, the, the scent of a parent is very calming for a child, especially when they're feeling quite um, anxious or they're feeling quite worried. Mm -hmm. um, like an unwashed scarf that they can wrap around their pillow or sleep with, an unwashed t-shirt, an unwashed jersey, something that has your natural scent that a child can then attach to and that generally is most problematic when a child needs to sleep. Okay. So if we think of a separation during the day, when a child is either at school or even just awake, if they're very little, they might not attend school. Generally, during the day, they should be okay. And lots of parents then say to me, but Nabila, my child struggles or would struggle to sleep because I'm not around. Mm. That would make sense because when you think emotionally of a child sleeping, that is actually a kind of separation. Because a child that is very young doesn't have the concept, and children very young don't have the concept of object permanence, they feel that if they can't see something, so they see my phone now when I hide it away, it must be, for example, gone. That means it doesn't exist. It's the very same way as when a child closes their eyes and they are sleeping, they can't see a parent or caregiver, so that parent or caregiver doesn't exist, mm. and therefore there is a kind of separation. During the sleep, that sleep separation will have to be practiced, especially when kids get very used to mommy or daddy laying next to them until they're fully asleep. And that could be quite difficult in terms of an extra layer of separation minus the physical distance that a parent is not around. So I like the unwashed clothing items that they keep. 
um, and that can help them soothe and emotionally regulate in a better way as they're falling off to sleep. Okay. I would encourage parents as far as possible, especially parents who have um, the understanding in terms of when they're leaving, what date they're leaving, how long they're going for, that they do practice these sleepovers at um, other family members' houses, it, uh, preferably the family member who is going to now primarily take care of these kids while they're away on hajj. Okay. So, so Nabila, let's look at some strategies for staying connected with children while, you know, parents are away. How can technology facilitate this? And should we be, you know, informing our kids ahead of time? And how do we reassure them that um, they will be connected with, with the parents? So one of the, the, the ways, obviously, we live in such an amazing time, alhamdulillah, that, I mean, through a video call that you can immediately see the person, even if the person is thousands of miles away. I do think parents need to normalize the kind of video calling that they do have in the check-ins that they do have with their kids on a regular basis. So, for example, try and not overcommit in terms, I'm going to phone you every hour of the next 20 days that I'm away from you. No, mm. that's a bit unrealistic. I would say have a check-in every, I would say once every 24 hours as far as you can. Hajj is a very uh, exhausting journey and you are in the sacred lands for such a short time that your sleep schedule gets completely messed up, your eating gets uh, completely uh, on a different routine, for example, not like home. Your day becomes night, your night becomes day because of the ibadah and tawaf that you obviously need to do. So parents need to be mindful in that you're not overcommitting to your little ones, but I would use WhatsApp video calls, um, try and obviously FaceTime. Um, get and as you performing and doing certain special things, for example, if you see a kind of food that's your favorite, your child's favorite food, send a little picture and say, I'm thinking of you, I'm eating this today, and I, I think that you might really enjoy this, or something that just makes you connect or the child knows that you're thinking about them and the child is also allowed to do the same. For example, send a little picture and say, Mommy, I thought of you this morning um, because I'm, ha I'm having a breakfast that you, for example, make for me every morning. Mm. And the more connected and um, sort of, yeah, I think that, that everyday kind of connection that you sort of try and get to, uh, uh, try and get with a child every day in terms of, videos, pictures, or video calls on a regular basis, I do think that can go a long way in emotionally regulating a child and helping them feel better. How did you manage with uh, leaving your little ones behind? I mean, especially for your clients, how did you prepare them? What, you know, what was the reassurance, the connections that you made with them um, because of your time away? So, um, therapy, um, the way that I work in therapy, regular sessions with clients is obviously the, the gold standard in terms of how the therapeutic relationship progresses. And one of, well, lots of ways that I mentioned now I did use. One of the nicest ways is I asked them to bring their madrasa, kitabs and storybooks that I read with them mm -hmm. and try to explain to them that exactly what they learn about Ibrahim alayhi salam and Ismail alayhi salam and all of the stories that they learn and read about, mm -hmm. I'm going to be part of these rituals and journeys in a very real way. I then also asked them to draw uh, pictures, for example. I also asked all my clients, um, especially the very, very little ones, to write down or voice record where they could send me their special du'as. And I then noted it down in a book that I would then, I still have that book with me. And I those were their special du'as that I took their names on the plains of Arafah um, to, to make these special du'as for them. And they were really, really excited. I also took pictures of the du'as that I wrote down in the books for them and sent it to them and said, I'm thinking of you, I'm making you a du'a today for you. Is there anything else you want to add? And I then sent them pictures and videos uh, in terms of what I was doing so that they understood the special significance of where I am. Oh. The stories of the prophets really helped cement that this is an actual human being going to actually do the rites and rituals of Hajar alayhi salam, Ismail alayhi salam, Ibrahim alayhi salam, and they were really chuffed. And some of my kids that I actually named Ibrahim, they're like, oh, you're going to see the special place. Yeah. And they felt like this was something so special to them because of their yeah. names. Sure. Um, and I think that really, really cemented it and made it really um, connected for them. Mm -hmm. They messaged me and they uh, were allowed to contact me. And like I said, the, the most special thing was the du'a book. Okay. where 
Um, I wrote down all the uh, du'as that they requested with the names, mm. and I then sent the pictures to them on the on the particular days that I was going to obviously read the du'a and make the du'a for them, and they were really, really happy about that connection. I think, you know, even though parents are far away, uh, and, and, and children understand the concept, you know, maybe of temporary separation. But there's also, you know, and not necessarily in every case, but you know, with the with the with the tweens or the teenagers, they feel that disconnect sometimes with parents. But yet, parents reassure the little ones more. How can parents reassure their children uh, with all temperaments of all all ages that they are safe and they are still loved? while the parents are away and sometimes that love also increases for the bigger ones that that annoy you even more but you know not forgetting yes. them as well i think the, the temporary separation because kids of different ages understand the distance and the time so the mm. concept of time is actually quite interesting when you think of very little kids they don't fully understand tomorrow or next week okay. but they do understand things i would use things like sleep so how many sleeps until I leave? How many sleeps until I come back? Well, the older kids, they do have phones and they have devices where they have calendars. And there's a little bit more understanding in terms of time. Mm. But also they're not fully aware of this temporal kind of trajectory that things are now moving and how things move. I would say that as parents, you need to keep connected with your teens and tweens in the way that they understand things. So mm. they love social media or they love photos and videos and uh, video calls because they sort of um, uh, connect in that way. I think if you sort of just appease them in the way that they would like to be understood or be connected or be heard, um, I do think that is important. And generally, uh, in all the feedback I've had for even this year, Alhamdulillah, I know a few parents that are going on, on hurt is um, even last year when I was away, is the children that remain behind um, with caregivers, grandparents, uncles, aunts, they're actually really, really spoiled. So they had a really good time. So mm. when parents come back, they're like, oh, you can stay for longer. Like, I had a <laughs> lovely time. So I think the, the, the biggest anxiousness and anxiety when I think of really boiling it down to where the anxiousness lies it's actually the parents who are mostly anxious. Okay. The kids are actually not that anxious once yeah. the process is unfolded and they're now staying with granny and grandpa because grandpa and granny are going out of their way to mm. make the nicest food and spoil them and give them the extra five minutes of sleep in the morning, which mommy is like, nope, you need to get up right now. So I, I do think that the anxiousness of the, the parents themselves is something that they probably then... Um, mostly fear yeah. and not necessarily the actual uh, the actual children yeah. to be honest i'd be a testament to that because last year when we went to the airport it was so hard for the parents to let go um some great ideas from nabila shukran after the break we look at other ways parents can use to prepare their children for being aware as well using the countdown calendar and other coping me me mechanisms to handle the separation just after the short break do continue watching life matters as we discuss preparing young children while the parents are away. So helping our little ones uh, with the anxiety, with the fear of separation, with the temporary separation, connecting them to their parents uh, while they're on this beautiful journey of Hajj. In this period, we're looking at, you know, just the heightened uh, energy that we have, the heightened e energy we have, just thinking of our hujaj. And none other than Abila, who's also a Haji herself from last year. She's uh, online actually carrying the hat, the hat rather of uh, educational psychologist. But I want to dig into her brain as to her experience from last year. But uh, Nabila is passionate about serving the Muslim community who currently is battling with seeking mental health services. Nabila specializes in play therapy as well as parent support and counseling, trauma debriefing, adolescent talk therapy, navigating the awkward parent and teacher talks as well, and hosting workshops and training for children, caregivers, and educators. So um, I think, uh, Nabila, if I could just latch on to some of your experiences um, and uh, some connections that you made that stands out for you, not just with the, with the kiddies, chatting to them, some of your clients, 
um, while you were away, but just the uh, just a quick uh, snippet of um, your life on Hajj, um, please, as we can just reminisce. Um, I am actually very, very nostalgic as lots of Hujjaj have already left, alhamdulillah. They are so fortunate and blessed and lucky. My experience last year for Hajj was actually really, really special. And when I talk about a special invitation, I'll just briefly share how I actually got to go on Hajj last year. Hmm. Is um, In December of 2022, I actually wanted to go for Umrah. And my husband um, hasn't been for Umrah at all. I've been for Umrah once before with my parents, alhamdulillah. Okay. And I then said to him, I'd really like to go for Umrah in December. And his brother was actually on his way for Umrah at that point. And I said, let's join them. And my husband has this view, which many people might not agree with, but he felt that the fard of Hajj was far more important than the um, nafil or sunnah of, or the sunnah act of, of Umrah, which is not fard upon mm -hmm. a Muslim. Um, we had a little bit of a disagreement and I was actually quite upset because I wanted to really, really, and I had my heart just yearned to see the Kaaba. And specifically, I said I wanted to see the Kaaba and I want to go on Umrah because I understand the Sahuk list. It was December and the Hujaj obviously were getting ready to leave by basically June the next year. And my husband, as far as I know, hadn't been on the Sahuk list, but I had been on the Sahuk list. And when I actually... I then applied for my husband. I respected his wishes and I said, okay, let's apply and I'll wait eight years or nine years in the back of the queue to try and get um, us to go for Hajj because he didn't want to then go for Umrah and I thought maybe I'll make another plan with my parents or someone else or my dad to go and, and, and go on Umrah. And within two days, our entire life circumstances changed where oh. I was on the South list from 2009 and I had a, a basically... Um, uh, a dormant application, but I had no mahram attached to my name because my mom, dad, and my sister had gone, and I hadn't gone with them in 2009. That was pure takdeer, and I, I was not ready. My invitation yes, wasn't there, so well. and I didn't go, but my sister, my mom, and my dad, alhamdulillah, went. That means if I had a mahram attached to my name, which I then added my husband to my mahram, uh, to my name, I wasn't married in 2009, we then went to the top of the queue, and I then told my husband two days later that Allah answered my du'a and guess what, we're going on Hajj and we're number one and number two in the queue. And he looked at me completely shocked and he's like, how? And I'm like, because this was Allah's invitation. I had a yearning to see the Kaaba and Allah loves me so much that I got my wish and you got your wish. And you're going on Hajj, so we don't have to have a disagreement about going for Umrah. And we got ready and Alhamdulillah, we got ready and we went for Hajj. One of those freak success cases uh, because we were also on the list for quite a while and I think they lost our um, application or, oh no, we didn't know that we needed to pay um, some fees. Yes, you need to and, pay. And then there was yeah. a delay and it was like, okay, we paid and there was another delay. And then the year that we also found out, Ya Salam, was also like a week or two that we had to get ready. My husband was still in Johannesburg. But wow, what a beautiful story, mashallah. And I'm sure there's lots of moments and um, when you spoke about the du'as and how the du'as actually connected you with the children, um, it just brings about now my next question, you know, talking about du'as, how can parents involve their children in making the du'as and praying, um, you know, for their loved ones, even if it's, uh, you know, just not the parents, but praying for them. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, you know, mm -hmm. praying for their safe return and that they are safe. So I know that one of the, the top uh, to ask from Mahaj is like, my, my family must just be safe at home. So connecting the children mm -hmm. with those special du'as. I think du'a is such an interesting concept that I, with young children specifically, their innocence and their, their real taqwa that we can learn mm -hmm. from them in their children will often say to me, Allah loves me and he gave me this. Like without blinking or without hesitation. So innocent, yeah. Had nothing to do with the money that mommy and daddy <laughs> earned. I do think that you need to hold on to that. So when you ask about the du'a, that du'a is so precious and real and genuine um, that often the du'as from little, like I said, from little mouths and little human beings are always the most impressive du'as for me. Yeah. I think that make it a ritual in that you ask your children, what du'a would you like? And this can be an everyday thing. I also think that Allah has promised us as Muslims that our du'as are always answered, but they're not answered immediately. So they're answered mm -hmm. either immediately, they later given in our lives on this earth, or they saved for the akhirah, depending on what is best for us. And we don't have that understanding. And the moment little children understand that, I think that belief 
in terms of what they then seek um, is something so special that children's du'as are never just surface level. There's always a deeper something, like I really wish mm. um, for something much more deeper. And I think that is something you need to hone. And I think parents should take their kids to us. I mean, seriously. So I know lots of parents now write to us down in a book. Um, and children can also write them if they're able to write themselves in the book um, mm. what to us they want. And I think that's really, really special that you have a little du'a book that your, your children are able to write their du'as down and they can be quite extensive. The children always ask me, they're like, can I write and ask for anything? I said, yes, within reason, Allah allows you to make du'a for anything. Um, and yeah. these children's du'as are just fantastic and amazing to actually see. So I, I really, really, really love that. And I think that's something you have to take note of and keep yeah. in mind. It's, it's sort of the innocence, as we describe it, the fitra, the pureness that they have within their hearts. You've mentioned some... Um, some ideas and role-playing activities that can help children understand the rituals of Hajj. How about some creative ways to maybe understand the countdown? You've, you've uh, given us ideas about the countdown calendar and make that separation more manageable for children. Um, you had some ideas of some tokens per week we were, we were chatting about as well. I think the, the nicest thing, especially for very, very young children, because mm. their concept of time is actually not as developed uh, which is normal, and that's a normal developmental stage, I would say that um, a simple piece of cardboard or paper that you stick up on a fridge or a wall that is quite accessible in your home, where you actually allow the child to put stickers or mark little crosses, or um, they can draw little things in each little block, and that gives them until gives them an, a concrete idea of the days and sleeps that they obviously have to get through by the time mommy and daddy, inshallah, do return. Um, in terms of the tokens, I find that little children like something that's that's real and it doesn't have to be magnificent. I mean, you would automatically give a child a tub of Play-Doh or you would buy them a little toy or you buy a boy a little car. I would say that if you put these uh, away for them and depending on the weeks that you are away, I would um, allow a child, for example, to open um, maybe one little car or one little, uh, have a little Play-Doh that they play with. And sometimes what parents can actually do quite creatively is re-gift some of the other toys that kids have that they might have forgotten about. So you don't have to go out and buy new things. Just make it special as a little special surprise. Or if you, for example, leave lots of parents have left like little vouchers or uh, put money in an envelope to say plus this ice cream money. So mm. um, on a Friday evening or Friday afternoon, you can take the kids and go and have ice cream. And they put the envelopes together. So you obviously prepared things um, ahead in terms of activities. Children may be wanting to go out in terms of uh, going to uh, a, a little playground or play area. You can, you can really um, make this special in terms of they are being spoiled while you are away. And that obviously can ease more the parents' heart more than I think the kids. The kids are going to have a good time. Anyway. Yeah, distract them. I, I think that was a big thing for the families is distract them all the time. After the short break, we talk about special requests and, and emotional support during the time um, that you are away, the parents. And, and you know, even if it's grandparents, they actually quite miss their children. The grandkids more than they sometimes miss their big, you know, grown kids. But more after the short mm -hmm. break with Nabila as we discuss uh, our little ones and the separation when our parents do go on Hajj back in a moment. Welcome back in our last few minutes as we highlight our little ones, our children, and also those young adolescents and tweens and teens. Um, you know, keeping that connection with your children while you are away, not just, you know, to, to, to keep that parental bond still going, but also for them to understand what a beautiful time of the year it is. And I know our guest is reminiscing right now because she's a Haji of last year, but also to connect with um, the Hajis that next year when your children sees you um, back with them and you perform this journey last year, they actually still feel that connection. So online, 
discussing and guiding us is Nabila Gangat, uh, an experienced educational psychologist who has special interest in working with toddlers, young children, adolescents and teenagers. She is able to deal with both emotional and behavioral issues as a play therapist. Um, Nabila specializes in play therapy as well as parent support and counseling uh, trauma debriefing, also host workshops and training. So Nabila, coming back to that emotional support uh, for those little ones, how can parents address their children? Sometimes special requests, we, um, you know, you bend the, you, you bend the rules a little bit, um, or even the emotional needs during their time away when connecting with the, the children, um, yeah, in, 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 in Makkah or Medina, and then the kids are at home. I think um, specifically with very young kids, and I mean, you as a parent need to also understand how picky your kids are in terms of food, clothing, um, make sure that everything obviously is prepared, like in terms of logistics. I know that some moms have prepared food ahead of time that maybe the people who are now taking care of your kids don't have the burden of, I mean, I don't think it would be a burden, but if your kid likes something very specific or particular to make that ahead of time and freeze it, for example. Um, and then also just in terms of, the everyday thing, so whether there's exams or there's special projects or they need something particular for school in terms of a project or assignment, if any or as far as you know, these things can be sorted out ahead of time. I think that also gives parents um, assurance in terms of uh, their kids are going to be okay at home. And within reason, depending on who your kids stay with, I do know and I do believe that your kids will be in really, really good hands. Um, and I think obviously the uh, guardians, caregivers who are taking care of them will obviously do their best. Mm. We're also very fortunate to live in an age of technology. So we call to mom or dad or video call in terms of, well, we need this or we can't find this or whatever you're particularly looking for. And I think if you're able to secure that and allow kids to contact you when you obviously contact your kids as well, I think that's important. What I, just to touch on this point, which some parents still do, is they feel that the more they allow, or the more they, or the longer, rather, the longer that they tell the child ahead of time that they, they are leaving, they feel that the child's behavior gets worse. Mm. I actually disagree with that sentiment. I feel that sometimes the time is actually what mitigates in terms of the child feeling very abandoned or not having enough time to process the separation. Okay. So I'm huge. I'm, I'm a huge fan of actually informing um, kids, especially even babies or little ones. So um, I know that sometimes moms feel that no, kids should not be accompanying them to the airport or hmm. they should almost like be sleeping and then they like sneak out the house and leave. I, I'm, not a, I'm not a fan of those. Okay. I feel that that leaves more anxious feelings and thoughts with children for you not telling them. Mm. I feel that telling them is actually the better way to then engage long term in terms of children being away and this is something that isn't a secret or something that is kept uh, away from them. And I, I, I do think that that open communication that you allow, so it's not like, no, we're not speaking to you for a month. Yeah. I do think that then all of that should help in terms of uh, allowing kids to feel better because mommy and daddy are still available. I didn't think of that uh, now that you brought it up. What are some of the do's and don'ts? Uh, we spoke a lot about, you know, the do's and trying to help them, but often we don't realize the, do, the don'ts um, does more harm that we might think, you know, is, is a better idea. So you've mentioned the one, don't sneak out of the house um, for, and knowing that you're going to do it for such a long time. Uh, just things that we shouldn't be saying to them, the correct language. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the correct language also goes around. Remember, kids are kids. And, mm. and the reason why kids have a special place in our society is they mess up, they make mistakes, they are not perfect, they are imperfect. And they are allowed perfect. to do that. So a lot of parents, <laughs> yes, yeah. a lot of parents will say to me, but I'm worried that my kids are going to misbehave. Well, your kids are going to misbehave. Mm. And I think within reason, you need to not almost uh, say to them, no, you have to be really good when, mm. when Auntie Fatima is looking after you. If, Auntie Fatima will deal with the situation in the moment. Yeah. Whether the child messes up or the child does whatever, it's not on the parent and it's not a reflection. A child is their own human being and their own individual. So I find sometimes a lot of pressure, which kids have told me that, my mommy said I must be really good, but I'm finding it really hard because now I must, like, I can't, like, you know, they're almost like under pressure because they can't do anything or step out. Yeah. Children mess up, they make mistakes, they forget things, they lose things. It's just how life works and that's normal. So I would say no prediction in terms of 
saying your children need to be absolutely perfect for the time that you're away because that causes more anxiety. The big one for me is sneaking out or not saying a proper goodbye or allowing them to know when you are actually leaving. Mm -hmm. So telling them that you're going is one thing, but then if your flight is on Friday morning and it's very early, wake the children up, allow them to come and accompany you to the airport, say a proper goodbye. Yes, there will be tears, but that is okay. They will understand and their tears are healthy. I mean, those tears and the crying in that, I'm going to miss you. I mean, that's a, that's a normal feeling. And then in the moments of where you feel that maybe the kid becomes very emotional or the child is really upset, I would always use what I really like to use in terms of acknowledging the child's feelings. So not saying stop crying, which many, many parents do as a okay. default. I would say, I know that you are upset, my darling, whatever the child's name is. I know that you're upset, Fatima, because mommy's going to be away for a long time. And just address the feeling. Mm. The moment you address a child's feeling and saying that, my darling or Muhammad, I know that you're really, really upset or you're really angry because you are you are now going to miss mommy and mommy's going to be away for a long time. Mm. Sometimes I find very young children become very clingy, very attached, or they go the opposite way where they, they don't need you. They become super independent, super resilient. They almost mask their feelings. So they're yeah. like in a state of denial and they wear this nice mask. You're like, oh, my child suddenly became so independent. They can do lots of things themselves. That's also unhealthy. So you need to mm. watch out for any behavior changes or they become very attached to you. They don't want to sleep in their own beds. They don't want you out of their sight. These are all normal behaviors, but address the feeling and try and stick with the feeling in terms of, uh, I can see you going to miss mommy. You are upset. You are allowed to miss mommy. And the crying is normal. The crying is okay. So rather instead of saying stop crying, I would say, uh, it's okay that you're crying, but mm -hmm. maybe let's think of another way. That if you are missing mommy, can you go and get the scarf that mommy left for you or oh. the jersey that daddy left for you and you can wear it or you can hold it and you can smell mommy and daddy and maybe that will make you feel better. So try and uh, not always catastrophize and get to the, the child to that super emotional state. Yeah. Try and think of ways that they can emotionally regulate to, to maybe calm down. Th that is a very common one, you know, dealing with your child's crying, especially when you are away. Um, and then dealing with them crying when you're having people over or when you're leaving for the day, that is, like you said, it's the hardest yes. for the parents to deal with. Just, uh, just a quick one, um, Nabila, what comes up for me is when I left on Hajj, my daughter was a year old and I was actually still breastfeeding and I remember my milk just dried up when I was there. But sometimes we don't realize that children actually understand. So what are the common um, age uh, issues that we we say oh no that they don't know I'm really leaving or they don't understand what's happening so I just won't include them in these conversations so I know one years old my, my daughter was quite young um, she was actually very on my mother so she did well with us being away but what are the ages that we realize children don't understand we think we, rather we they don't understand but they actually do really understand mm -hmm. and that we should be communicating with them I would say that children as young as a few months old, even okay. a few weeks old, understand that a, a, a primary caregiver or parental caregiver is, 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 is away. Yeah. So they don't have the concept of time as we have, but they just know that something is different in terms of uh, this person that used to feed me is gone, mm. or this person that I'm used to smelling is gone. So if I can yeah. simplify it that way, because yeah. remember children have very basic needs when they're babies under a year old. It's the feeding, the eating, the sleeping. So yeah. this person that used to feed me, make me sleep and bath me, well, I don't smell them anymore because the primary scent is smell when they're babies. Okay. I would say they all know. And generally, as long as there's another maternal or paternal figure that they can attach to in a healthy way for their time, mm -hmm. that shouldn't cause too much harm or damage. Okay. Although any separation at any age has consequences. Some of the consequences are regression in the milestones in terms of what they're able to do, okay. regression in terms of how they then see you, which you then need to understand, you need to rebuild. Mm. So there's always a consequence that you need to bear as a parent and the parent's consequences are much higher than a child because you are more responsible in terms of percentages. Mm. The child is the innocent one in this entire situation or scenario. I would say mom and dad, they need to be very present emotionally available and very conscious of them and mindful of their behavior when they return mm. because at any age, I would say even babies, they mm. might not want, want to immediately come back to you. Mm. And that attachment is something that needs to be rebuilt in a positive way 
that yes, mommy and daddy were away, but now we are back here and we are going to now assure you within reason that we now see to your needs in, in the way that you, you need. Uh, Nabila, that was really enlightening answer. Unfortunately, time is up and we have to wrap up. But I just want you to leave our viewers, our listeners, our moms and dads and parents, caregivers with um, just some final tips and also some, some advice from your trip of last year being on Hajj. I think as a, as a Haji, the most beautiful thing that everyone needs to really, really pay attention, it is a very emotional, overwhelming journey. The thing that struck me the most and I really want people to pay attention to is the variety of race, gender, color, creed, um, socioeconomic status that Allah invites and it's giving me goosebumps as I think about it. I just love watching people. I love watching people. I think that it's incredible to see the rainbow nation basically congregating on the plains of Arafah, on the plains of Mina, and to just pay attention to see how our Muslim Ummah is amazing. Pay attention and try and connect with people. I would try and make small talk with a few actions and words with every person I met. Where are you from? What's your name? Where do you live? And I just think that connections, which is so amazing for me to see that mm. we live in our little bubble here and we think that this is how Muslims are supposed to be. And you'll see all kinds of Muslims from all over the world. It was the most incredible uh, sort of weaving together of every kind of Muslim person that I've seen from all over. It was incredible to see. Okay. I think also pay patience. Every single person comes with their own history and understanding in terms of what is okay and what is not okay. So try and be your best, most helpful, patient self. And yes, you will have difficulties because everyone is different. And I do think that if you bear patience, you will be able to then uh, deal with everything that comes your way in a, in a good way. Be flexible, be resilient and try and adapt. Things happen that are totally out of your control and just roll with it. That's it. Shukran Nabila, always a pleasure chatting to you. Hope to see you again soon. And I know we had a discussion of talking to little oh. ones about sex and sexuality. Hopefully we can still do, do that show, inshallah. But all the best. Be strong through this time that you reminisce. We really appreciate your time. Till then, assalamu alaikum to you. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi. A big thank you to Nabila for sharing her expertise with us today. Remember, preparing little ones for parents' Hajj journey requires empathy, communication and creativity. May Allah bless our families and guide us all on our spiritual path. Wassalamu alaikum. Until next time, for more insightful discussions, a very good day to you.